Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. We'll uh, get going with this afternoon's uh, audit committee meeting. Um, Councillors uh, Gazola and Yanetsky uh, are away at, I believe, I think, conference and vacation, and um, Councillor Galloway Silak will be here uh, a, a little late, uh, but she will be here for audit committee. So, with that, um, we will go on to item number one, which are audited financial statements, and we'll turn it over to you, Sherry. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here today to present the 2014 annual financial report to the audit committee. I will be providing a bit of context to the consolidated financial statements and will prevent, present a few slides that provide a high-level overview of the city's financial condition. Then KPMG will present the findings of their audit. We welcome Mr. Matt Bedick to the meeting today. As a reminder, the accounting staff prepares the city's consolidated financial statements <coughs> in accordance with Canadian generally accepted accounting principles as established by the Public Sector Accounting Board. Explanations for significant variances year over year and from actual to budget for the 2014 consolidated financial results have been included in the financial statement discussion and analysis section of the annual report. Please refer to page 17 of the color section of your package. <clears throat> so I'm not planning to run through those now. Instead, I'll explain what is included in the statements and what is different from the, 20, uh, the December 31st, 2014 tax-based operating and enterprise results for the city, which you already had the opportunity to review in March of this year. The consolidated financial statements combine the results of the tax-based operations, enterprises, local boards, capital activity, and reserve fund activity. They also account for the two government business enterprises, Kitchener Power Corp and Kitchener Generation Corp, which is known as the solar roof on the Kitchener Operations Facility. Local boards include the Centre and the Square Inc., Kitchener Public Library, Belmont Improvement Area, and Kitchener Downtown Improvement Area. The format of the financial reports presented in March for the tax-based and enterprise operating results is significantly different than the format required for the annual audited consolidated financial statements. We thought it would be helpful, by the way of the next two slides, to walk Council through the difference in the annual surplus on the statement of operations in the consolidated financial statements, approximately $39 million, compared to the operating results that were presented by the Financial Planning Division in March for the same time frame approximately $5 million. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, the consolidated financial statements include the results of tax-based operations, enterprises, reserve fund activity, capital activity, and the activities of the local boards, plus the effects of the government business enterprises. Further adjustments are then made to these results to have them reported in line with the standards set out by the Canadian Chartered Professional Accountants Public Sector Accounting Board, also referred to as PSAB. The largest adjustments required to comply with PSAB relate to the city's tangible capital assets, also referred to as TCA. The Statement of Operations recognizes the revenue streams that were used to fund the creation of these assets with the exception of debt proceeds. However, the expenses incurred to purchase the assets are excluded, as they show on the Statement of Financial Position as an asset, and then are expensed each year by dividing the cost evenly over the useful life of the asset. This expense is referred to as amortization, and you will see the adjustment for the year's amortization reflected in the next slide. We are required to remove debt proceeds and principal repayments from the Statement of Operations as the debt is accounted for on the Statement of Financial Position. Interest paid on the existing debt, however, is recorded as an expense in the Statement of Operations. There are other adjustments required, but these have a much smaller impact overall. So what does this mean? The accumulated surplus of $1.1 on the Consolidated Statement of Financial Position is not a surplus as you'd be used to hearing of in regards to the operating results. These are not dollars available to be spent. 
They are a representation of past investments that the city has made that continue to provide benefit to the city going forward. This includes things like tangible capital assets, investments in Kitchener Generation Corporation and Kitchener Power Corp, and reserves set aside for specific purposes. In the previous two slides, we saw that the largest impacts on surplus are those related to tangible capital assets. The net book value of tangible capital assets, which is the cost less the accumulated amortization applied, has continued to experience modest growth over the last five years. Each year, the net acquisitions, additions less disposals, have exceeded the amortization expense applied in that year. The net book value as a percentage of cost has remained steady at around 68%. If this percentage were dropping significantly, it would indicate that our asset renewal, problem, asset renewal programs were in trouble. The next few slides will present the financial condition of the city. Financial condition speaks to the city's ability to finance its operations on an ongoing basis, despite economic changes and changes in other environmental factors such as growth within the city. This chart shows the five-year trend in the overall debt balance for the city, broken down between the various purposes of that debt. Municipal debt has decreased from its peak of one 112 million in 2013. 2013 was the last year of the EDIF program, therefore debt is expected to decrease for the next number of years as that debt continues to be paid down. Net debt per capita after removing amounts recoverable from enterprises and others is at its lowest since 2010. This can be seen in section eight of the financial and statistical review which is on page 132 in the annual financial report. This chart here shows the five-year trend in the consolidated reserves balance. As can be seen in the graph, the balances have been increasing since 2010. Council passed a consolidated reserve policy in 2012, which provides a framework for building up reserve balances and ensuring they are used as intended. The next couple of slides will provide a bit more detail about the various types of reserves and their balances compared to the target, their target levels. One of the components of the reserve fund policy was categories for improved reporting. The five categories shown on this slide were used during budget discussions and the next slide shows 2014 closing balances within these categories. This chart is split into three sections. The top section shows the actual 2014 ending balance for each of the five reserve categories. The middle section shows the target ranges for the reserve categories and how well the reserve meets the minimum target. The bottom section shows the actual 2013 ending balances by reserve category and the change between 2014 and 2013. First, I will draw your attention to the far right total column here you can see that the total ending <coughs> reserve balances in 2014 were 52.5 million, which is 75% of the minimum target balance of 69.6 million, and is up from 47.9 million at the end of 2013. In actuality, most reserves should never transfer from one to the other. Each has to be funded of its own merits through its own funding sources. Thus, a more accurate picture would show that for those reserves that are funded to at least their minimum level, they have 26 million in excess, so that amount above the minimum target. For those reserves that are below their minimum, they have a $43 million shortfall. And again, that's just to reach the minimum target level. Therefore, in summary, the city is still 43 million short for it to have its 43 reserve funds at their minimum level. So there, although there has been improvement overall, the city is far from being in line with even its own minimum target reserve balances. Further strides were made in improving capital reserves, 
but there has been a continued draw on the already strapped stabilization reserves, which exposes the city to financial risk factors such as weather volatility. So this graph combines the city's debt and reserve positions together. Rating agencies consider a debt to reserve ratio of one to one to be financially prudent which means the city would have $1 in reserve for every dollar in debt. As can be seen in the chart to the right, the listed comparator municipalities all hold more in reserves than they do in debt, with the exception of Waterloo and St. Catharines. The city's ratio is about two times that of Waterloo and almost 10 times that of the city of Cambridge. And of note, the charts to the right are the 2013 <coughs> comparatives as uh, all of the 2014 data may not be available at this time. At the end of 2014, the city has $2.54 in debt for every dollar of reserves. This shows much improvement from the 2013 ratio of $3.01. The magnitude of the city's debt load can largely be attributed to EDIF and was known before the approval of that 10-year program. As noted on the slide, Kitchener's ratio would be much lower if EDIF and enterprise debt were removed. The final financial measure to be presented is also the most complete picture of the city's financial health. Financial position per capita is determined by subtracting total liabilities from total financial assets and dividing by the population. This measure shows if the city has enough cash and investments available to pay everything it owes to others, including its municipal debt. The value of 764 in the comparative for 2013 is positive, so is the 2014 figure, which means that Kitchener has more than enough on hand to pay off all of its creditors. It, also, it is also close to both the average and median for this sample selected and presented here, so Kitchener is comparable to these comparator municipalities. Finally, as shown in the graph, Kitchener has kept a fairly steady position over the last five years, which shows that even though debt levels have been rising, the city is not in financial peril. The city will want to continue to maintain this strong financial position. The next slide contains some recommendations as to how to achieve this. <clears throat> Council is encouraged to limit new debt to that already planned for in the 10-year capital forecast and allow debt levels to fall as the EDIF debt matures. Continue to build reserve balances. This means resisting the urge to draw on existing balances for uses other than what the reserve was created for and continuing to make strides to see reserve levels brought to at least their minimum target level. Building reserves allows for sustainability as well as flexibility. The current trend with funding from higher levels of government is that the city must fund a portion of the project and the project must be something not already planned for. Having some greater reserves built up may allow the city to benefit from some future cost-sharing initiatives. Also, I can encourage you to continue to hold on to long-term investments as they provide investment income and cash flows year over year. So I will open up the floor to any questions. Uh, Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. I do have a number of questions. I guess my first question is, what is our, um, our interest payment uh, uh, um, that we're paying on our debt? Um, it can be seen on page 48 of the colored package. Within there, it lists out the operating expenses by type, and one of those is the long-term debt interest. And if we go to the far right column, it's 3.7 million approximately for 2014. Okay, so we're, we're paying out 3.739 million dollars in interest every year to um, service our debt. That's the uh, interest in 2014, which is comparable to what was experienced in 2013, and that's on over 100 million dollars okay. in debt. I guess I, I'm, I'm puzzled by the statement, if we didn't have EDIF in there, um, our debt would be less. But the reality is our taxpayers still have to pay the tax levy with the debt that's in there. Is that correct? Yes. Because the decision was made to take on the additional debt to have the program for EDIF uh, set up, that is 
continuing to be paid off over time. Right. So I don't understand the relevance of saying, well, if, if Edith wasn't in here, that we would, we, you know, our debt would be less. I mean, our debt is our debt, whether it's Edith or, or it, you know, it, it, whatever we purchase, that, that's our debt. That is correct. Okay. It's just been something that's been raised by council a number of times, so we've included that statement in. Okay. I can appreciate that. So as we're, as we're looking at the reserve reporting by category on 1-15, um, essentially what I'm understanding here is some of our categories are... Sorry? Oh, okay, I, I thought I was. I thought I was inter interrupting somebody. Um, each of our categories use. What I was understanding is that some of them are 26 million in excess, but some are well below. Yeah. Okay. Within those categories, there may be some that are over their minimum and some that are under their minimum. So I've stripped out all below the minimum and all above the minimum. Okay. Historically, is it not wiser to pay down your debt? And, and, and you did say that in your final summary was to reduce our debt. Um, I understand your statement about making sure that we have reserves for our for, to be flexible because we always want to have savings even in our household income. You want to have some kind of savings to be able to pay for those unexpected expenditures. But is it not more prudent to reduce, especially if we're paying $3 million a year in debt? I, I guess it, it depends on the percentage of interest that we're paying, um, depending on the interest that we're paying for our, um, our reserves, right? Are we, cause we, are we getting interest on the money that's in our reserves? Yes, as reserves are in a surplus position, um, that fund, those funds are invested in the portfolio investments and do receive interest. Okay, do we have an understanding of, and, and I mean, I did go through some of the financial statements, but I, I admit to being, you know, overwhelmed by the <laughs> amount of numbers and, and that's not my forte. Um, do we have an understanding about what the interest percentage that we're paying on our, our debt as it relates to the interest that we're getting in our reserve funds. So, for example, am I pay, are we paying 5% on our debt interest, but we're paying um, on our reserve, we're only getting 3%? Mr. That's Chap just numbers. I'm just grabbing numbers. Yeah. Right? Mr. Chapman, but usually that's the way it works. There's, there's a gap between we usually get earn less than you, than you pay. But, Mr. Chapman, maybe you can help us. Through you, Mayor Verbanovic, uh, you're correct that yes, um, our investment portfolio typically has a lower rate of return than our debt portfolio in, in the interest rate. Uh, to respond to your earlier question, um, even if it was desirable, the type of debt that's issued by the region on behalf of the city carries no prepayment option. So once we issue the debt, we have no ability to prepay um, or, or um, pay out the value owing on any of those debentures. So essentially, we're committed for the term of that debenture. Okay, and I mean, I, I guess I could compare it to a mortgage. Most, if you have locked it in, you can't really pay uh, a lump sum until it opens up or until you have a certain uh, anniversary kind of thing. Is that correct? Would that be sort of the basic understanding that a citizen might be able to understand? That's entirely correct, and with the exception of one debt instrument that was issued for the odd expansion that has a balloon payment in year 10, all of our debt is term debt, and therefore there is no window uh, at which we can prepay uh, any portion of that debt. Okay. Um, I guess my, sort of, my other question would be, we want to be sustainable, we want to be flexible in our reserves, but we did, there, we did hear that some of our reserves are in excess. Why would we not... Um, use that as an opportunity to, I know we, I just understood that we can't advance payment on our debt, but that, um, is there a way that we can reduce some of the debt, or is there something that we can do to reduce the debt? And, and, and sorry, just before you answer, just so you know, I went right away, since there's nobody in the queue, into your second five minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. And I do caution you that that excess that I reported was above the minimum target range. There is a minimum set and a maximum set. And um, just because it's above the minimum does not mean that there's truly what the council would decide is an excess within that reserve. Okay. Um, oh, that, sorry. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, you were talking about reserves uh, in, in terms of the ability to, be, to have that money uh, for opportunities that may come up. 
I guess therein is, is some of my concern sometimes that sometimes an opportunity comes up and we deplete or we, we bring down a reserve maybe lower than we should it, to take advantage of an opportunity. And that would not, would that not put us in a bit more of a, uh, a challenging position if we needed that extra money for something else, for something important, let's just say a weather related issue. And each of the reserves individually have their own purpose set aside. So it's not as if you can take from the capital reserves and transfer right. that money over to a weather um, reserve. So each of those opportunities would have to be um, investigated on their own merit. Okay, and, and I do understand that we're not, that was one of the things that was made very clear to me as I was learning about this from Mr. Chapman that we're not picking from one, you know, paying Peter to, for Paul and all that kind of stuff. But I'm still concerned that some of our, our reserves that are in a good position, we may have an opportunity to uh, do some work somewhere else because we're going to be getting a grant or we're, I don't know if this would fall into uh, credit for refund agreements. Uh, and, and that might be something Mr. Chapman might want to clarify for me. We enter into some of these agreements because it looks good, but it, it ends up depleting us in our, that specific reserve category. Mr. Chapman. Through you, Mayor Verbanovic. Uh, the policy that Council approved um, includes language, essentially do not raid language, which means that even if there's funds in one reserve, you should not raid that for purposes unrelated to the intent for which that reserve was created. So that should deal with the concern that you've raised. The fact that we have minimums, if we respect those minimums and stay above them, should ensure that we never get into a, in a, a precarious position. And I think you were asking a question about reducing debt in the future, or debt issuance in the future. Um, you may recall that Mr. Haggy is doing work this year on debt policy for Council, and one of the questions that he was asked to explore is what would pay-as-you-go look like for the City of Kitchener? And so whether or not that's a desirable direction remains to be seen, but you will be getting a report that will contemplate that issue uh, later in 2015. Okay, uh, I did have one other quick question um, on the uh, financial report, and that was on page 26. There's a pie chart, and uh, it, sometimes we see percentages. In this case, we don't see percentages. We just see what the total amount um, would be based on, broken down. So, materials 110 million and on and on. What percentage? Like, what are the percentages of these? I mean, if you look at salaries, wages, and employee benefits, 1.3 million, what percentage of this whole pie would that be? Okay, um, in the top green bar, um, we've disclosed the overall total of the expenses. Mm -hmm. So we're dividing 138 over 299, so okay. approximately 40% of my math is good on the spot, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm leaving the math to you, not to me. <laughs> okay, so that, that's, if somebody was to look at that, that would give them a, a, an understanding about that. Okay, um, and I think, oh, the other quick question was on page 31, I noticed that, um, I found it interesting actually, that we're taking in, I could be wrong, $109 million in taxes, um, and our user fees are at $94 million. Is that pretty typical of a municipality, or are we getting more because we own our own gas works? And um, I caution you, there's actually three numbers that need to be added together for our user fees. The first one is only gas works. There's another 43 million between our water, sewer, and stormwater enterprises, and another 44 million in all oh, absolutely. the other categories. Sorry, you're correct. So then we're actually taking more in user fees than we are in taxation. That's correct. And is that, so my question still stands, is that pretty typical of a municipality or is that more specific because, and I see Matt's kind of shaking his head and I don't know if he's shaking his head because of my question, is it because we own our own utility? Having our own gas utility significantly is um, causing us to have higher user fees than we would otherwise have without that gas okay. utility. Okay, I believe my time is up. So. It is, yep. Uh, thank you. Councillor Davey. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chapman already answered my question regarding um, the pay-as-you-go, which I'm very interested in seeing coming, going forward. My other question is um, with respect to the financial position per capita on 1-17. Uh, I can't recall if this, does this include all of um, the city's assets, including um, KW Hydro? 
including the hydro. Sorry, the hydro. Yes. The hydro. Yes, this will include uh, our investment in Kitchener Power Corp, as well as our invest much smaller investment in Kitchener Generation Corp. Okay, so this, this represents every single possible asset and investment that we have, the That's 764. That's correct, excluding our tangible capital assets. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, Councillor Marsh. Thank you, I'm just wondering about the minimum and maximum targets for our uh, reserve funds. Are these targets based on our debt level? Uh, are they, uh, are they uh, referring to the um, preferred one-to-one uh, -one ratio of debt to reserve? Or is it, uh, I guess I'm just asking how are they um, arrived at? Um, I'm gonna let Dan. Mr. Yeah. Ch Mr. Chapman. Through you, Mayor Verbanovic, uh, and perhaps it would be helpful if I circulate to you and Councillor Schneider the report that was referenced earlier from 2012 where Council approved a new policy. What I can say is that, um, no, it's not tied overall to our debt position. In the, case, in, in the case of every individual reserve, we looked at developing a minimum and maximum with reference to the requirements of that reserve. So, for example, um, you're aware that all of our utilities have a stabilization reserve that deals with weather, weather volatility, consumption volatility. And that was based on best practice from Government Finance Officers Association, which said a, a reserve of 5 to 15 percent uh, is appropriate for a reserve of that nature. So we applied that policy. In different cases, we would apply different policies using best practice. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That seems to be all the questions. So I guess we'll move on to okay. our um, accountants. I'm going to call Matt Batica from yes. KPMG to present his results. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. I'll move quickly through our report as we understand it was included in the agenda materials, touch on any of the high points and then accept questions at the end. So on the executive summary and status update, we just want to note that we have completed our audit work and once the financial statements are approved, then our auditor's report will be attached thereon. The auditor's report that is included in your uh, agenda materials is a clean auditor's report. There are no modifications or qualifications. We want to remind the committee that the consolidated financial statements do include the entities that are listed in the middle column, uh, including the Gasworks Utility Center in the Square, Kitchener Library, as well as the two uh, business improvement areas. Picking up on a discussion we had at the audit planning meeting back in December of 2014, every single auditor of every single financial statements in Canada is required to uh, include procedures in their audit that deal with the risk of management override in the preparation of the financial statements. Some of the uh, activities that we do to mitigate this risk are looking at selected journals that might be, uh, have a higher risk uh, tolerance as well as look at uh, estimates that are made by management, as well as look at significant unusual transactions. Through our work, we did not find uh, anything of significance to report. On the next page, we simply go through a number of significant captions to the financial statements and provide a high level overview of the types of audit activities that those captions uh, were referring to. But I won't go through those in, in detail. Part of an audit process is to determine whether the critical accounting estimates included in the preparation of financial statements are appropriate. We're also required to consider whether or not there is any management bias in establishing those estimates, as well as looking at all estimates together as a whole and seeing if there's any management bias. For example, if there are five or 15, it's a wide, quite a range, but five or six or seven different estimates, are they all estimated high or are they all estimated low? We haven't seen any change in the process for determining these, nor have we found any issues or concerns around that matter. One other matter we wanted to bring to Council's attention is the accounting for brownfield and adaptive reuse agreements. Provide a little bit of context here with respect to the programs uh, that the city has in developing such uh, properties within the city as well as a participation by the Region of Waterloo in some of these agreements. We noted that when a grant is approved by the city, the total amount of that grant should be accrued for and a liability recorded. 
if at some time that the region of Waterloo joins the program as well and provides their own tax relief, then a, res a corresponding receivable can be set up at that time. As a result of going through these processes, there was a small correction made to the financial statements in the amount of $200,000. A required communication of auditors to the committee is dealing with adjustments and differences. We're happy to say that any uh, adjustments that have been made to the financial statements have been agreed to by management and we don't have any uh, ongoing disagreements with anything. And that to the extent there are any uncorrected amounts, these are immaterial both individually and in aggregate. That concludes a formal report. We've provided some additional information in the appendices, but I won't go through that uh, at this time. But uh, through the chair, we'll take any questions. Great. Thank you. Councillor Fernandez. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for your, um, your report. And um, so my basic question is when you identified the 200,000 um, audit correction on the Brown Brownfields uh, grant programs, is that a high amount correction or is it relatively low in, in relation that, to? That, that's relatively low. Okay. And I'll remind the committee that we're dealing with a materiality level of approximately $6 million. So relatively speaking, that's a fairly low number. Okay. Can you speak to the, the, the debt ratio, the 2.5 the, the ratio? Can you speak to that or is that a uh, question That's really outside, outside of, of the scope of our work. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Any other questions? Doesn't look like... In, uh, in closing, if I may, I'd like to thank uh, you know, Brenda, Sherry, Roger, and their team for the work uh, that they did and the cooperation we received, Mr. Chapman as well, uh, and we appreciate uh, working with the city. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Matt. And, uh, not a question. And just, uh, I just want to thank you as well for uh, the, uh, the work that uh, you folks do, not just here, but at the library and the center in the square and at Hydro. Um, you, uh, you've served our community well, and we appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Davey. Yes, I just wanted to uh, move the report and comment briefly, if I could. Yep. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'd be remiss not to say that I'm, I was happy to see this come back uh, as expected. Uh, the city of Kitchener is in a strong financial position, and that's largely in part the, the good work of staff, and, and more, more importantly, I think, actually a disciplined council going forward. So I think uh, the um, recommendations and how we have to go forward in terms of repaying debt, working on our reserves, and most importantly, ensuring that we do not uh, issue further debt, I think is critical to continued financial strength. Uh, I also wanted to point out that this is the first year in the first report we've had in, in many, many years when we've seen our debt levels decline. Uh, a sum of close to $10 million was uh, paid off in, in EDIF, and I'm very, very happy to see that debt trend start to um, work downwards instead of upwards. Okay, any other comments? Not all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to uh, staff. I know a lot of work goes into preparing these statements, and it's uh, very much appreciated, uh, uh, all the work that uh, all of you have done uh, for this. So we'll now move on to uh, item number two, the second quarter audit status report. And I will turn it over to Karina. Great, thank you. All right, so my first uh, item today is report FCS 15-091, which is in your package, um, which is my quarterly audit status report. Um, today I'll be telling you about the employee expenses audit, which was a compliance and controls audit. Also in progress at this time, I continue to be working on the Community Resource Center's comprehensive audit, and that should be coming back to audit committee in December. Um, I've also just about completed the Office of Mayor and Council organizational review, which you were all uh, participated in. That should be coming back at the September audit committee. So employee expenses. Um, the objective of this review was basically to document what policies and procedures we have on hand currently, and also to test a number of transactions to see that our <coughs> controls are working and that employees are in, are compli in compliance with our policies and procedures. Um, so just to put this in context, employee expenses uh, involves a number of different transactions. 
Um, the first being um, any goods and services that we empower employees to purchase in uh, fulfilling their job duties. Um, for anything under $3,000, they can do it through two methods. They can either use a corporate visa card to purchase the goods or services, or they can use their own funds and then be reimbursed either through petty cash if it's less than $100 or through a check requisition if it's over $100. So that's one category of expenses. Um, employees are also entitled to claim parking and mileage if they use their own personal vehicle um, in the duties for their job. And then the final category is conferences, which as you're aware can include things such as the registration fee for the conference itself, as well as hotels, um, transportation such as airfare, mileage, trains, etc., cetera, um, as well as per diems for, for meals throughout the conference period. So that's what we're talking about when we see employee expenses. It could be any one of those types. So for this audit, I started off by interviewing the accounting staff to get an understanding for myself what the policies um, are that are in place and what procedures they go through when they're auditing these types of expenses. Um, I reviewed these policies in detail and compared them to best practice. I also um, took a deep look at the past audits that I've done um, for a number of these topics. So I've done a review of our corporate visa program, um, parking and mileage, as well as I do annual petty cash counts. So taking a look at what things I had recommended in the past and whether those things had been uh, implemented and what the impact has been. And then finally, I rounded out the review with uh, testing a random sample of transactions from 2014 in all of the different expense categories for employee expenses. So overall, I'm very pleased to say that the processes and policies that we have are, have very strong controls in place. Um, any of the transactions that I looked at, I did find that they had legitimate business reasons behind them and that proper backup was attached, so um, original receipts were included. I did not find any instances of fraud, which is great news. Um, I did find one instance of purchase splitting, which I'll explain a little bit more about when I talk about the visa um, transactions. Um, the biggest finding that I will talk about in the recommendation section is that we do not have a consolidated expense policy. So we have a number of standalone policies for each of the different um, expense processes um, with instructions. They're all posted in different locations. So it's very difficult for employees to go to one central location to find what they need for their employee expense um, transactions. So now I'm going to take you through the testing that I went through. Um, the first group of testing was on our petty cash. So just to give you an, a feeling for what that process is, if someone purchases goods or services for the corporation using their own funds and it's less than $100, what they would do is take the receipts to a petty cash custodian in their location. So they're, they're at our various outside locations. There's a couple here at City Hall and at the COF as well. Um, and they would fill out a voucher that goes with it, which would tell the amount, the reason, business reason for the expense, and the account code that they would charge it to. Their supervisor would sign off on the voucher. When they hand it to the custodian, the custodian will give them the money, sign off that they've given the money. The employee will also sign to say that they've received it. It's as simple as that. So in 2014, we had uh, about $61,000 worth of petty cash vouchers that were redeemed. And they were typically for things such as office expenses, um, license renewals, medical notes, meeting expenses such as refreshments, and uniform alterations. So there was nothing um, that caught my eye as something being inappropriate. They were all very valid business reasons for those expenses. Um, there were a few that were maybe less clear that could have had a little bit more description as to what they were for, but generally they were all um, valid reasons. Um, I did find as well evidence that accounting staff, so once, once a, P, a petty cash custodian starts to run out of money in their float, they will go to accounting and hand in all the receipts Accounting will then audit those receipts and, and top up the reserve. Um, they, I have found evidence that accounting is checking up on any that are not clear or that have the wrong signature or are missing information. So from that point of view, there's a very strong back-end process to make sure that people are doing the right thing. The next test that I did, um, I actually com combined a number of different types here. I, I took a look at every employee that either had visa card transactions, were issued a check, or had mileage and parking. This allowed me to get a, a very good cross-section cross of expenses and to see their expense habits across a number of different categories and to make sure that they weren't double-dipping in, in multiple categories. 
Um, I took a 5% sample of all of those employees. And of that sample, 64% were completely perfect with no issues. Um, what I was looking for was one, that they had the correct signature for their supervisor on it. Um, they had a valid business reason, they had original receipts, and that they weren't purchasing anything that was prohibited, such as alcohol or tobacco. So I'm gonna break down those three categories now to tell you what I found. Um, so with the checks, um, so these are for anything where the employee has used their own funds and it's over $100. Um, in 2014, we paid out checks to employees for 316,000. And of these, I did not find a single issue wrong with them. They were all completely perfect. For mileage and parking, um, for in 2014, we had $135,000 worth of claims for mileage and 55,000 for parking. Um, one thing that I noted in the procedures is that we don't have a policy currently for um, a submission timeline. And what I found in the sample was that it, there was a number of them that I found that were a year, up to six months to a year, sometimes greater than a year old. And the issue that I have with this is that the older the claim is, the harder it is for the supervisor to verify that that was a valid expense. They can't remember what their, their employees were doing probably a month ago, let alone a year ago. Um, some of the claims were lacking a bit of detail, so there were some where the employees were traveling on a daily basis and the description was simply site visits or customer visits, didn't have an actual address, so trying to verify that the kilometers were correct was difficult. So I did go back to management in those areas to see how do they verify that when they're signing off on it. And a number of the areas did have um, backup systems, so they had um, Amanda or a claims database where they had the actual jobs that the people were working on that they could verify that the mileage was correct. Um, but in general, what they're doing is just making sure that on a monthly basis, the total kilometers is about the same every month. I also found one handwritten form, which in and of itself is not a hugely wrong thing, but the forms themselves have automatic calculations, which pick up the current mileage rate and also apply parking on a prorated basis if it's applicable. Um, when you use a handwritten form, it means extra work for accounting and that they have to verify that the math has been done correctly and that the current rates are being used. So it's inefficient to use a handwritten form. And visa, so um, in 2014, we had roughly $2 million worth of purchases made on the corporate visa cards. Um, the one thing that I found that I had mentioned earlier was the purchase splitting. So this was a case where an employee had purchased six items of equipment and split them into three separate invoices that were paid on three separate days, even though it was part of the same purchase. Um, and this was done simply to expedite the purchase and be able to do it um, on site with the visa card rather than having to go through purchasing to get a PO. Um, so the employee has been spoken with and told what the proper procedure was and that they need to, to be following that rather than trying to expedite the purchase. Um, two other minor things that I found with the visa. There was a few instances where um, they had purchased things on their visa card for a conference, such as the registration fee, but then not filled out the conference form. Um, they didn't have any per diems, they didn't have any mileage, so they probably figured that they didn't need to fill out the conference form. It was all taken care of on the corporate visa. But we do need the conference form filled out so that everything goes to the correct GL code and that we can capture it as part of those total conference fees. Um, the other issue that we found was uh, there was one example of a gift or reward recognition that had been purchased for an employee and there was no taxable benefit form that was filled out for payroll. So again, the employee was just reminded that in the future, if it is a, a cash or near cash gift or reward, they need to have the accompanying taxable benefit form. So aside from those ones that I looked at, I also looked specifically at conference expenses. So I took all of the expenses and then drew a 5% sample from, from that. Um, I looked to make sure that there were valid receipts. Um, the the uh, per diems were calculated correctly. So for example, if the conference included lunches that they weren't also claiming for the per diem for the lunch and that they had the proper authorization. So for conferences, you need a DCAO or a director to sign off on it. So we're making sure that that was in place. Um, I'm very happy to say that this process 
I found absolutely no errors. Um, accounting does an amazing job at auditing these forms before payment is made to the staff. Um, the staff person is very diligent in going through everything. I found evidence of checking, even down to things like Googling the kilometers to make sure that they were correct for mileage. So I'm very happy with that process. And one more test that I did, as I mentioned in the scope of this, was to look at all council expenses of all different types. Um, overall, as you know, you don't spend very much, very small dollars spent for council. Um, and I did not find any major issues. There were two examples where I found um, mileage that was a year or more, but as I mentioned, there is no policy, so it's not wrong. It's just it would pr I would prefer it if mileage was submitted um, on a more frequent basis. Um, and there was one case where mileage had been submitted that was actually related to a conference, so conference forms should have been filled out as well. Very minor issues, though. So recommendations. So as I mentioned, I would like accounting to work on putting together a consolidated expense policy, which has all of the policy um, items that we currently have all in one place, as well as the instructions on how to fill out the various forms um, and procedures to, to get about, go about getting their money reimbursed. And this will make it a lot easier for staff and make sure that all of those um, items where there might be some confusion or overlap, that they're all in one place. So for example, um, pointing out that if you have expenses for mileage that are related to a conference that you're filling out the conference form, not the parking and mileage form. Um, the second recommendation is that I would like to um, implement a quarterly submission time frame for the mileage and parking claims. So this allows management to have a better sense for what their employees are actually claiming and that they get um, submitted on a more timely basis. And then the final um, recommendation, I've given specifics to, to staff to follow up on, but having some periodic reminders to staff regarding some of the common errors that we're seeing. Um, already we do this with the visa when we send out an annual notice to the approvers and to the card holders, just on some things to watch for. I'd like to expand that to include some of these other processes where we've got some common errors happening. So are there any questions on that? On there, there are a few. Um, Councillor Fernandez. Uh, thanks, Karina. So I just wanna go straight to the um, one about the visa and that was where you said we had spent one, uh, close to $2 million on, uh, on, on a visa, on, uh, on our visa. So with, I think everybody knows now, if you have Visa or you have Capital One or whatever credit card you use, there are all kinds of points you can receive. How, what, how are, we, are we getting those points? How are we monitoring those points? Um, how do they get... Um, transferred back into usable dollars, if that's possible, yeah. and where? So I've got a bunch of a bunch of questions around this. So let's just stop with that one, and then I'll go to the next sure. question. We actually receive a rebate from the credit card company. I believe it's two point five percent. Brenda. Brenda. Um, through the mayor, it's actually one percent rebate that we get on all of our uh, purchases on U.S. Bank. Okay, so 1% of, of the $2 million is what we're, all we're getting back? That's correct. Okay, that's not very much. So if people are using their own private, their own personal credit card, you're gaining, you're gaining points for that. If you're using it for, um, for conferences or expenses, you're, you personally are gaining the benefits for that. Is, does that seem like a fair, uh, reasonable thing to, to be happening? I mean, we're talking significant dollars here. One percent is, is not, is literally nothing. I mean... Not all employees have corporate credit cards. No, I know that. But the, the, so the people who do, so the, the, the so um, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about personal credit cards. So for, for example, I decided to go to a conference and I put it on my own credit card. I'm, I'm gaining points for that. So is there a policy that we maybe should be looking at where if you're doing something for business with the city that it should go through one credit card and only one credit card so that the city actually receives the benefit? We've got to figure out how to get better than 1%, but... 
Um, I'm going, I don't really know how to answer that. I've seen that policy in other um, companies before where expenses are not allowed to be submitted without using the corporate credit card. But as I said, not all employees have corporate credit cards, so trying to monitor who does and who doesn't as the expenses are coming through, I think it would be an administrative nightmare, personally, but I don't know okay. if any... Mr. Anyone? Chapman? Through you, Mr. Mayor. If you refer to page 2-2 of Karina's staff report, there's the table at the, in the top half of the page, and I think what is telling here is that um, of the total $2.3 million subject to audit, $2 million of that is coming through Visa and 300000 through check reimbursement. Many of those check reimbursements are items that could never be funded through a credit card anyways. So the vast majority of employee purchases are happening through corporate Visa. Even if all of those check requisitions were to be able to be converted to Visa, that would equate to about a $3,000 rebate. So I would suggest that most costs are going through corporate Visa at present, and the additional um, rebate, if we were successful in moving everyone towards corporate Visa, would be very negligible at this point. I'd also like to point out that um, not all vendors accept Visa, so... There will always be, even if we had that policy, there would always be some expenses going through the other types as well. Okay. Okay. Um, I won't go any further than that. Um, the other question I had was related to, sorry. When you're talking about the purchase splitting uh, that on 2-21, uh, do you have a, do we have a sense of how much that was? Um, it was on that roughly, purchase? I'm trying to think. Each one was under three thousand, so it was under under ten thousand total. And, and the, I did this, verify that the inventory actually exists. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a case of, of um, faking the invoices. Okay. Uh, the conference expenses, when you were talking about the, the sample that you did, you, no, sorry, that was the wrong. Yeah, the sample you did was only a 5% um, sampling. Considering the amount of money that's spent, is 5% is a, a, a significant enough of a sampling? I believe it is. Um, it's standard percentage that I use in all of my audits. Um, as well, there were some conference expenses that were captured in the other tests, the visa checks and mileage. There were some within that as well. And I'm quite satisfied by going through what the procedures are and um, what I saw from the staff member involved, that there is no very, very little risk in that area. So I think 5% is suitable. Is there a, a way that we can reduce our mileage and parking claims? Um, for example, ha making sure that sites, site visits, so if a meeting is, uh, the majority of staff are at the cough, that the meeting is held at the cough and that they're not all coming to City Hall uh, or vice versa. Is there, uh, do we have policies in, in, in um, those kind of processes, those procedures? I believe there are any policies dictating where meetings need to be, no. Okay. Would it be wise to maybe take a look at that the majority of people who are, are, are hosting the meeting, it, that, it, it, the, that they stay at their location so that maybe one or two people are charging mileage instead of the opposite. Okay, Mr. Wilmer, if you want to respond, and then I see Mr. Taggy's chimed in, and then the five minutes is up, so we'll, we'll go on to other members of council. Uh, Mr. Wilmer. Through the mayor, certainly that is a de desirable outcome. We have communicated that to staff, and it is a best practice. So in, in my opinion, common sense prevails that, that the meeting is held where the majority of people are located. Okay. Mr. Taggy, did you have something to add? I think the CEO answered the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Davey. Thank you. Just one question regarding the mileage. My understanding was there was a, there was a claim far in the early term of previous council where someone went back a couple of years in terms of claiming mileage, and at that time it was identified as an issue. And I was under the impression that, for at least for council, there was a one-year minimum. You had to put your, have your claims in by the end of the year. So did I hear you correctly saying that you just uncovered a recent one where there was a payout? Yes. Yeah, so when I looked at council expenses, it was handed in at the end of the year, which is not wrong. There is no policy written. Um, if there was something agreed to within council, I'm unaware of it. Um, but my recommendation is that it be submitted quarterly. Okay, and it was, was it the end of the year for the current year? Yeah, so it was 2014 expenses submitted early in January. Okay, okay, I, I'm, I'm hugely in favor of that recommendation, thank you. 
Councilor Marsh. Thank you. Um, Karina, thanks very much for this report. Just wondering, uh, so at the beginning of your report, you mentioned your, your presentation, you mentioned that you looked at um, some of your previous audits and the recommendations that you had made and whether or not they had been followed. And you said that you also looked at best practices elsewhere. So I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on any findings with regard to those two items. Sure. Um, in terms of the past audits, um, I've listed them there in the report. Um, most of them I had done an original audit and then a follow-up audit, in which case I had confirmed that the recommendations had been implemented and that there were significant improvements. So there weren't any areas of high risk coming out of those. I, I did need to refresh my memory just to make sure, sure but um, that that's where we started the review was what was done in the past. In terms of best practice, a number of the things we are already doing. So the main one that came out of it that we are not doing is the consolidated expense um, policy. Um, most of the other things we are doing, the, there was one exception and that was making sure that all payments are made um, through electronic funds transfer, but that's only if you have an electronic expense program, which we do not, so it really didn't apply. No. Okay, so uh, today was the first time, just a very minor thing that I learned that we pay for medical notes. Yes. Uh, that's nice of us. Uh, is that a best practice? Does that that was a new policy that was implemented just recently when we went to the attendance management with uh, our benefits provider. So they are requiring people to provide medical notes for their absences, so it was a decision made that all staff would be reimbursed for those medical notes that are being required. Okay, thanks. Councillor Ethington. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of quick questions. When it comes to mileage and conference expenses, could you just clarify me, for me, do we have a timeline in place for council claims? Um, for, for mileage, just straight mileage, no. It's same, similar to employees. There is no policy currently in place. In terms of conferences, um, the policy is that within 30 days of returning from the conference, you will submit your expenses. So if there is a late claim by a councillor for mileage, it's still paid? Yes. Okay. Only up to the current year. Right. That's, that's the policy, correct? Yeah. Through the mayor, we have um, a policy uh, specifically for council that the expenses, any expense must be submitted by January 31st. Um, to be eligible for reimbursement, and including what happens mileage. if it's not? It's technically not allowed to be reimbursed. Thank you. And who reviews cancer expenses in general through the year? The mayor, well, I can answer it. I mean, the mayor signs off on council expenses and the CAO signs off on the mayor's expenses and right. vice versa, the, C, uh, the mayor signs off on the CAO's expenses. And then from there, they go through all the checks and balances that everything else goes through in accounting. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other questions? If not, um, we'll move on to the next report. All right, so the next report is the risk management update in report FCS 15-92. Sorry. Um, Actually, yeah, no recommendation was required on that last one. No. Sorry, go ahead. No recommendation on this one either. It's just for your information. Um, no, because it's an internal staff direction, so she, they, they just do it. Okay. All right. So if you recall, last year was the first year that I had brought forward um, an annual risk update for council. Um, just to give you assurance that management is handling risk management in, in an effective way. Um, in that report in June last year, I had said that my goal is to really embed risk management across the corporation so that we have staff at all levels thinking in risk management terms as a daily process. So they're looking at what are the things that could stop me from meeting my goals and how do I mitigate that? And I had indicated at that time that there's three levels that we really need to look at in order to do have that embedded into our culture. It's at the governance level, process and tools, and then at the frontline level with staff training and experience. 
So today I'm just going to walk you through some of the things that I've done since last year um, in those three areas and then looking forward what we can expect next year. So on the governance side, not much has happened in this category. We continue to have a risk management policy. Um, and this is, as I mentioned, the second annual report to audit committee, which I'll continue to do each year. On the process and tools side, um, I've created a number of different templates for risk assessments, um, very specific to our industry. So we've got a number of them for building projects, a number for road construction, um, general projects for business divisions, um, as well as instructions on how to go about doing a risk assessment. And I've placed all of those on an O drive where anyone can access them. Um, I've also made risk assessments a standard part of any service reviews and comprehensive audits going forward. So that's one of the first things that I will be doing when I do an audit is to identify what risks could harm the division from meeting their, their objectives. With regards to staff training and experience, so as I mentioned before, um, I created the Risky Business Capacity Course, which I've delivered two sessions of now and have um, trained 25 different staff. And those 25 staff were all enrolled in the project management course, so they are all, are all project managers and will bring that knowledge back to the projects that they're leading. Um, I've also done risk assessments in three different divisions as part of comprehensive audits, so within purchasing, the community centers, and the arenas. And that covered approximately 40 staff who have now gone through that process and can use that in their daily basis. And those three divisions are now monitoring those risks that they identified through that process and helping to mitigate um, those those risks. I've also got two examples of two other initiatives throughout the corporation that have where staff have come to me for advice on, on what to do and how they could apply risk management concepts to help prioritize some of the work. So the first one is an example in, with the water and sewer main reconstruction. So they will be building a process where they can prioritize their reconstruction projects based on the impact of a water main or sewer main break. So what is around that particular location? Is there a hospital or is it a vacant field or you know, what impact would it have? And then what's the likelihood of a break actually happening? So what is the um, condition of the pipes and the surrounding area? So using those two factors, the likelihood and the impact, they can help prioritize what order they do their projects in. The second one is an example from Legislative Services who are currently working on a policy review where they're looking at all the council policies and will be bringing back ones that need major updates or revisions. So they wanted to know um, what order should they do them in because it's gonna be a long process to bring them all forward. So we've decided on a process where they will prioritize them based on, first of all, the impact of not changing the policy. So if we don't change the policy and it gets, put into, gets enacted, will there be uh, life and death impact, whether it be financial impact, whether it be embarrassment for the city, those are just some of the things that could happen if we don't change particular policies. Then how often is the policy used? So is it one that is used once in a blue moon or is it something that is being used every single day, in which case that impact would become a reality? Um, so th those two factors will again help them prioritize which policy review items come forward to council in what order. Well, those are two really good examples of how this is being embedded into the way that we do business and people are starting to, to use these techniques. So going forward, um, my first goal is to start integrating risk management concepts into business planning. So I'm gonna be working with Lori Major in the coming months um, to figure out a way that we can work that into the business planning cycle. It may not end up in the actual business plan that you would see what the risks are, but I want people to start thinking about what are the risks that will impact them and could stop them from meeting those business plan objectives, the projects that they've set out or their core service. And then coming up with um, mitigating factors to help, um, to help mitigate those risks. Also, I'd like to add the templates that I talked about earlier to the intranet so that they're more widely available and help promote them. Because right now, the only people that know about that O-Drive are the people that took the course. So I'd like to, to promote that across the city so that everyone can, can get to those uh, templates. The capacity course will continue to be offered, although there won't be specific dates. It'll be in the catalog as on request only. So if any teams or groups would like the training, I'm more than happy to come to their teams and um, provide it for them. And then going forward, obviously there'll be more risk assessments that are done as I do more audits. So each time I do a comprehensive audit, it will be included in the, the audit plan. 
All right. Are there any questions on risk management? Councillor Fernandez. Um, so risk assessment, assessment to me means, you know, sometimes we daren't step out the door because we might slip on a sidewalk or trip over something. This is a different kind of risk assessment, I think, what you're explaining. Is that, is that, would that be a better understanding? Um, it, that is a very basic example that you've given, and it can apply to anything. So it's basically identifying what are the things that could stop us from meeting our goals, whether that's a project goal, whether that's a divisional goal, and then determining what do we need to stop that risk from happening, whether we transfer the risk to someone else through insurance, whether we uh, eliminate the risk completely, or whether we just mitigate it. Okay, so it, it's pretty clear and evident that risks, uh, especially in our operations division, would be very obvious to the average citizen. You know, if we don't fix the sidewalk, we don't plow the street, we don't cut the trees, we don't, like, all of those things are very obvious. But where would risk be less obvious? For example, I was thinking of in our HR department or our communications department, things that, there, that it's, there's not really a tangible evidence of if we don't do a risk assessment. I mean, they can range across um, all seven categories of risk that we have. So just as an example, some, some risks that I've come across within divisions that may not be obvious to citizens, um, there may be high turnover risk. So because employees are dissatisfied or there's something going on in the division, they may have a higher than normal risk of losing key staff. So that's a risk that needs to be mitigated. They need to do something about that. Um, there may be risks uh, just related to their processes. So risks that we're um, spending excess money or not being efficient because a process uh, needs to be revised, things like that. So those are not obvious to, pub to the public, but they are things that we identify through these divisional risk assessments or through a project risk assessment that, that could be mitigated. So is the risk assessment um, essentially, the hope of that is, is to create uh, better efficiencies and to make sure that our processes and our policies are not only adhered to, but that they are beneficial to the end user, which would be our residents and our citizens in the, in the city. That is certainly one outcome, but the overall goal of risk assessment is that we meet our objectives, <coughs> regardless of what they are. Okay, all right. When are you offering the next course? Whenever you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, uh, I'll check with you and I'll sign up. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I think that looks like it's it. Great, uh, great job uh, yet again for uh, the work on these uh, on these two audits. And uh, on behalf of council, thank you. Uh, you're a, a small show, but you uh, do mighty amounts of work. So thank you, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so motion to adjourn, moved by Councillor Marsh. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, we'll uh, we'll do the special council part right.